So we we drove out to um, the Midwest for vacation. And so I was like, oh, we'll just audio book it. And between the drive back and forth, I barely had covered half of the book because it was like 27 hours or something ridiculous. But you subjected your family to the Oppenheimer audiobook? They loved it. Or they lied to me. Either way. Well, I mean, I read it when it came out like 17 years ago. So that doesn't, I mean, like, I don't remember. So once wasn't enough. I just remember that it was great. Nerd. Uh-huh. You know, so I had to read uh-huh. it again. Right, sure. Nerd. From New York Times Opinion, I'm Ross Douthat. I'm Michelle Cottle. I'm Carlos Lozada. And I'm Lydia Polgreen. And this is Matter of Opinion. So last week, Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer came out, and all four of us saw it. Not together. Not together, um, (laughs) except in spirit. But so did a lot of other people. The movie has already made more than 80 million bucks at the box office. Now, if you haven't seen it, I don't know that anything we'll discuss is the biggest spoiler, given that the movie is based on extremely famous historical events, but... We probably shouldn't promise not to have any spoilers, right? Spoiler, the good guys won World War II. Oh, well, that's that that itself is a controversial statement, Carlos. But we'll be talking about whether the movie is really about the good guys, what its moral vision is, what it says about when politics and potentially world ending science collide. But we'll start with the basics. What did everybody think about the movie? Silence. Come on, come on. What did you? <laughs> okay. Let's 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 hear I'm it. Jump I, in. Fun family fair. I'm going to jump in. Yeah. I, I thought the movie was spectacular. It's obviously going to generate some controversy about whether they were too soft on communism or made Oppenheimer too much of a hero. But it was ambitious. It was, of course, gorgeous. There were some weirder moments in it that are kind of Christopher Nolan's forte. But on the whole, it took what was a sweeping, huge book. American Prometheus, it won the Pulitzer. It is well worth a read and really gives it a good narrative that drives you through what is an unacceptable three hours. No movie should be three hours. But (laughs) this one was good enough that I didn't start to fidget like a four-year-old until about two and a half hours in, which is always a good sign. Carlos, what did you think? I really enjoyed it. I um I wasn't as troubled by the length because it sort of tells two stories. It tells the story of the race to design and test the atom bomb. And then it tells the story of how Oppenheimer was sort of cast aside by the very government that had deployed him for war making purposes when he was no longer useful and when he became kind of an irritant. And I mean, those stories are woven together in the movie. So to me, since there was so much that was worth getting into, um, I wasn't I wasn't troubled by by the length. I, I didn't think it was too long at all. I love a biopic. I love an epic book. I love an epic movie. I mean, the performances I thought were incredible. And, you know, I have to say I was astonished by the box office numbers that so many people wanted to see this movie because I think most people who go to the movies during summer blockbuster season aren't necessarily looking to be challenged in this way. But yeah, I I found myself quite swept up with it. Yeah, so the box office was remarkable. And since one of my like big things is, you know, the decline and fall of the American movies and so on. I feel churlish saying anything negative about Oppenheimer because it is it is terrific that it did so well. And Nolan is terrific and the cast was terrific. I wasn't sure about the last hour of the movie. So, you know, it does this sort of there's sort of the central forward momentum narrative carrying you through the Manhattan Project, culminating in you know, the big explosion, right, which comes about two-thirds of the way through the movie. And then there's the aftermath in the 1950s, which takes two forms. You follow both Oppenheimer through the sort of closed, unfair kangaroo court hearing where he loses his security clearance over his various ties to the many communists who were associated with his social and intellectual world in the 1930s and 40s. And then you also get the failed nomination to Dwight Eisenhower's cabinet 
of Louis Strauss, played by Robert Downey Jr., in a really terrific performance. Strauss was a Republican hawk, and Oppenheimer famously became a critic of sort of arms race politics. But so the movie is sort of culminating in Louis Strauss not getting the Secretary of Commerce ship. And, you know, there's uh, you can see what Nolan is doing here. But honestly, you know, to me, there was just a pretty big gap between the drama of the literal atomic bomb and the drama of Louis Strauss's cabinet nomination. And I I, I, in the end, I felt like that was an artistic failure. I totally get your point. But in a blockbuster movie, you have to have a villain. And who are we going to make the villain in a movie like this? It's a very complicated, weird subject. And you had to have an antagonist for Oppenheimer. I, I actually I actually disagree. And I think it's, it's actually a, a fascinating artistic choice because watching this movie, I thought so much of it takes place in kind of the perfect setting for a film that is in a lot of ways about the professional managerial class. These dramas take place in these like incredibly claustrophobic, bureaucratic, drab meeting rooms. And the only reason that you know that this is an incredibly important proceeding is that you have this assaultive (laughs) score that's coming at you with these incredible strings playing. And I think that there is this this symmetry that feels very real to me. I guess it's a metaphorical symmetry between, you know, the very real destruction of the atomic bomb and the very real power of personal grudges and spite between members of the professional managerial class over, you know, petty politics and power. Um, so to me, that felt like a central tension and um, and storyline of the entire movie. I agree that that's a critical element of this story and in some ways, you know, just as dramatic as the race to develop the bomb. You know, you can imagine the movie focusing on on the Trinity test and then on Oppenheimer's transformation and sort of an activist against the H-bomb, worrying about what he had unleashed. But the story is about how the government turns against him, how it found him dangerous. And uh, something kind of remarkable is that, I don't know if, if you all saw the story, but just like last December like of, of this past year, the energy secretary, uh, Jennifer Granholm, finally nullified the commission's revoking of Oppenheimer's security clearance, saying that it had been, as more information came out about what the hearing had, had been like and the, the unfairness of the process, that they just couldn't stand by it. I like the fact that the book and the movie really drive home how confusing a political time this was. So, like, well before the bomb or the hearings, you had this whole concern about, on the one hand, the Nazis, and and this is the major race you're fighting on. But but even before Oppenheimer was drafted for this project, just, like, so much churn about communism. And so you had these two competing tensions, and he almost didn't wind up in charge of the project because of his relationships. I think people forget what just kind of a weird global time that was. And, And this does a really good job of just, like, trying to drive home how much cloud there was around everything. Yeah. Well, I mean, it feels weird to say this with a three-hour movie, but, you know, you're struck by all the things that they kind of had to leave out. Um, You see how in the movie, he's this kind of like immediately charismatic professor at Berkeley, right? Like it starts with one student and then suddenly there's, it's packed because he's so captivating. He was actually a terrible teacher initially. He was unintelligible. Um, he taught himself slowly to become a better teacher, and that cult of Oppie kind of grew up around him. What Michelle mentions about kind of the, the the ferment of the moment is sort of even more alive in the book, even around physics. The movie kind of glosses over this because you don't want to spend too much time on it besides like, oh, look at all these cool formulas on a chalkboard, you know. But, you know, his genius was in helping others crystallize the ideas that they would pursue. And there's a moment in the movie when I think the Matt Damon character, uh, Groves, asks him why he hasn't won a Nobel Prize yet. Because everyone around him had Nobels. You know, it's like super, um, you know, stressful. And you're like the one guy with no Nobel. <laughs> Tell me about it. You know, and it's that the Nobels are awarded for like super specific, deep contributions to a particular field. And Oppenheimer was kind of interested in everything. He was too distracted for that. He was a great enabler and crystallizer of other people's ideas. 
I think one of the interesting things about that particular moment in physics and science, right, is that prior to World War II, prior to the Manhattan Project, there was still a way in which science was operating outside of what we now think of as kind of the, you know, American university model. It was much more European. There's a really strong aristocratic vibe. And and Oppenheimer himself is much, he's he's rich, right? He's a rich kid. Yeah. I, I'm not sure this is completely, completely conveyed in the movie, though it's clear that, like, he's vacationing in New Mexico. You know, he basically puts the the Manhattan Project, where he likes to go <laughs> for vacation, right? It would be like if if you were like, well, you know, I really like this little town in the coast of Maine. Let's build the atomic bomb there. And, you know, the, <laughs> there are a couple local lobster fishermen, but they won't, they won't object. Um, I guess I wonder what, you know, as the resident reactionary, I, I thought the movie up till the sort of final 30 minutes was actually quite effective in making a case that, you know, Maybe Oppenheimer, once the project was over, shouldn't have a security clearance. I mean, I think the movie does a good job of portraying Oppenheimer as a very complicated, fairly unstable figure, someone who literally poisoned the apple of his professor while in graduate school, someone who was friends with tons of communists, ran a program that was successfully infiltrated by communists, apparently only had sex with either communists or ex-communists. His brother was a communist, don't forget. His brother is a communist. Um, uh, You know, the, the question is, does he, should he have this security clearance? And the moment when Leslie Groves played really well, as always by Matt Damon, testifies and, and is asked, you know, based on the current Cold War era security guidelines, would Oppenheimer pass muster? And he has to say no. I mean, he's right, (laughs) isn't he? Yeah. Although I thought the line was great because he said no, but under the current system, I'm not sure I would have cleared any of these guys, which kind of gets to the period where scientists didn't automatically think of themselves as extensions of the political argument. But it gets to the period where under the circumstances of a war against national socialism and imperial Japan, you have to say, yeah, you know, if the best scientists are sort of compromised by associations with communism, it doesn't matter. You have to have them in there. But then once you're in a Cold War environment with Soviet Russia, you probably wouldn't run the Manhattan Project the same way. I think that's right. But I I think that there's also, um, to your point, Ross, like there's a sort of a noblesse oblige around uh, Oppenheimer. And and that, I think, goes hand in hand with another big theme of the book and the movie, which is, you know, his kind of naivete. You see him floating in this world of ideas and theory and, you know, communism and the Spanish Civil War is a romantic cause. And all of those things are true, but they're all taking place in in an environment that's outside side of, you know, kind of hard politics and more in the realm of the of the theoretical. And I think that what you're seeing in the film is this, and actually in history, is this move towards a much harder and more concrete reality in which the people in this world actually have to deal with the consequences of, of theory. And it seemed that he saw losing his place in the establishment, the inner circle of decision-making about what the future of the country should be and how we should be dealing with these weapons, that it was a huge loss for him to lose his seat at the table, um, you know, inside. And he assigned basically zero value to the kind of moral mantle that he could and and, and I think did pick up, um, really gets at this kind of like professional uh, managerial class and, um, and sort of noblesse oblige clashing. Yeah, there's a piece for Vox on that last point um, by Hayden Belfield um, that's called Crybaby Scientist that basically is just a, a – if you want to read the, the most anti-Oppenheimer take in this movie environment, that's the place to go. And Belfield basically argues – a version of what you just said, Lydia, that this was a guy who imagined himself as this core decision maker, but who basically, you know, invented the bomb and gave it to the national security state and then was totally unable to manage or master the forces that that he'd unleashed while maintaining his desire to be seen as someone who was, you know, the insider sort of, you know, steering the ship. Um, I think the piece is unfair to Oppenheimer in many ways, but it's worth reading the strong anti-Oppenheimer take, which is also another question for you guys. 
There's also been a lot of criticism of the movie from the left, arguing that it's just too kind to Oppenheimer. It doesn't spend enough time on the actual realities of what happened um, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. You know, once again, Americans whitewashing their own sort of their own evils via Hollywood. What do you guys think of that critique? My response to that is my response to a lot of these things, which is that not every movie or every piece is about everything. So this was about Oppenheimer. You can focus it on that. I mean, we can have another three-hour biopic on what about the fallout in New Mexico? I mean, there's been talk about it has ignored what happened with the people who were downwind of the Trinity test. Yes, all of these are like questions, but again, not every movie is about every piece of a puzzle. It'd have to be longer than three hours, Michelle, and you already no, opposed that. No, I so. object on moral yeah. principle to movies that are that long. I, I think, um, you know, for, first of all, like, it was a real choice not to portray or show anything from what actually happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which was, you know, utter and total and complete devastation. And when I finished the movie, I, I took the subway home and then immediately read uh, John Hersey's uh, Hiroshima, which is, you know, an extraordinary book um, that that really kind of gives you a sense of of what took place there. And And I think at the end of the day, I actually think that the way that the movie handled it was was probably right. It would have felt, I think, somewhat gratuitous to go outside of the narrative of the movie and, you know, have like newsreel footage or, you know, something that, that, that sort of gestured at the kind of destruction that this bomb actually wrought. And I felt that the, the moment where he's speaking to a cheering, flag-waving crowd and they're, you know, stomping their feet at Los Alamos, excited and celebrating that, you know, they've won the war by dropping this bomb on, you know, what was arguably a largely defeated enemy, um, he sort of has this kind of moment of conscience and and, and what have you. So I, I think that was probably the right way to, to sort of handle that. But the thing that was, that was wild to me is there's this moment where Oppenheimer says, you know, sort of justifying the use of the bomb, that demonstrating the destruction of it will be so great that it'll usher in like the greatest peace that mankind has ever known. Um, and in, in one regard, he was right in the sense that you know, no one has ever deployed a nuclear weapon in a in a conflict situation since then. But in another way, we have not actually seen the greatest peace humankind has ever seen since then. Um, so I, I don't know. It's it's um, it, to me that 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 moment in the film really really stuck with me. Yeah, there's a moment when I think they're showing images from the actual atomic bombings are being shown, and I think you see Oppenheimer looking away from it. Right. So in a way, the movie is giving his perspective and is sort of showing that for all his guilt and so on and sort of nightmares, there's sort of the the nightmare scene where that you referenced Lydia of sort of the cheering crowd with the sort of undertones of atomic destruction underneath it. For all that, Oppenheimer is also sort of maybe refusing to see, right? The movie doesn't show you because yeah. Oppenheimer himself does not want to fully see what he what he did. The authors make a distinction between Oppenheimer taking responsibility, uh, like, yes, he he made this thing, but not feeling guilt over it. Yeah. And I felt that that was that was somewhat portrayed in the in the movie. Um, what I liked, Ross, about that moment you mentioned when Oppenheimer looks away is that you see the colleagues around him and they're all flinching. They're watching, you know, and and it's and it's painful for them. But he sees something and then immediately looks away. Well, what's also interesting is, you know, the, the justification, and I think actually this has sort of become the conventional wisdom, was that even though Japan was on the verge of defeat, you know, dropping the bomb saved lives. And you sort of see that in the amazing scene of of Gary Oldman playing Harry Truman, sort of waving away um, the histrionic Oppenheimer saying he has blood on his hands. So, yes, I mean, I think this notion that ultimately dropping the bomb saved lives has become with a kind of conventional wisdom. And thank God for the atomic bomb, which is a very influential essay by uh, Paul Fussell in The New Republic, which was published in 1981, I think really sort of articulates that that view. But I also think like one of the things about the legacy of the atomic world in which we live that like nobody really ever talks about is, you know, the Cold War had real 
consequences and the fact that it couldn't take place as a direct confrontation between the Soviet Union and the United States meant that um, it pushed the conflict out into um, essentially the, the decolonized world, right? And the proxy wars of the Cold War, I mean, it's depending on how you do the math, somewhere between 10 and 25 million people died, you know, depending on when you start counting and, and who you count. But, you know, wars in Vietnam, in Congo, in Ethiopia, which is my mother's native land, Guatemala, all across Latin America. So um, it is interesting that there's this kind of binary choice between, you know, the peace and never having a nuclear war. But um, boy, did it set off a huge number of proxy wars that just happened to have as its victims, not the people of the United States or Russia, but the people of largely the developing poor black brown world. Yeah. And I don't think you get a sense of that complexity from the end of the movie. My reading, at least, of the end of the movie is is much more sort of binary that, you know, it's not that Oppenheimer created this sort of complex new world where maybe direct superpower conflict becomes rarer, but proxy wars become more common. Instead, the movie ends with this vision of atmospheric destruction, fire spreading across all of the earth, the true apocalypse that we've all lived in some kind of fear of ever since the 1940s. So in that sense, it's sort of presenting a vision of just sort of science slipping away from all political control and or politics just doing what it will with terrifying technology. So let's take a quick break here. And when we come back, we're going to try and bring the conversation about the intersection of science and politics off the movie screen, out of the past and into the present. So we'll be right back. And we're back. So we're going to talk now for a minute about not just what the story of Oppenheimer says about history and the early Cold War and the life of the man himself, but about our own future here 80 years onward in the beginning of the 21st century, where, you know, the question hanging over lots of issues, nuclear, biowarfare and biotechnology, now artificial intelligence, is can human beings control and tame the technologies that we create that might have potentially world-destroying consequences. So for all of you, watching a three-hour movie about the first time, arguably, the human race created such a technology, did it fill you with optimism about the human <laughs> the human capacity I, to sort of restrain itself once we've let certain genies out of the bottle? I don't think we need to be feeling so optimistic. It's not been around for that long. There's still plenty of time for us to blow ourselves up, Russ. So there's there's this one amazing moment in the book that I was hoping would would appear in the movie. And that's that when Oppenheimer dies, one of his three eulogists is George Kennan. So you have the father of the atom bomb being eulogized by the father of containment. And containment, of course, was the policy that, depending on how you interpret it, was was, you know, helped keep the two superpowers from going to war with one another with with nuclear weapons. He has a, a an amazing line in the in the eulogy. He says, "On no one did there ever rest with greater cruelty the dilemmas evoked by the recent conquest by human beings of a power over nature out of all proportion to their moral strength." So it it did not leave me with with much optimism. There's also this interesting development where Congress has looked at this movie and taken the opportunity to reintroduce some ideas about how to get their arms around it. I mean, we've seen Senator Ed Markey from Massachusetts hawking his proposal to ban AI from launching nuclear weapons. Now, I don't think it's going anywhere, but it, it's got a very Dr. Strangelove doomsday machine feel to it. But, uh, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, I mean, I think it's so interesting because I, as I was watching the, the movie, I actually uh, thought a little bit about um, and and don't don't be mad at me. I thought a little bit about Elon Musk. Um, you know, <laughs> he, 
he is not the kind of Sanskrit reading sophisticate that Oppenheimer was. And he is also clearly um, of a different kind of political um, set of commitments, uh, if you can even call them commitments, than Oppenheimer. But just looking at, at the various points of view that he's taken, I think Musk shares this quality of like, of kind of bizarre naivete about the way that that politics actually works. And I think like Oppenheimer, Elon Musk is a, is a great synthesizer, perhaps not a great engineer of his own right. But there is this kind of protean quality that Elon Musk has. And in his naive replies to right-wing, um, even anti-Semitic and other people with those kinds of political views on on Twitter, I do see kind of shades of of a very kind of crude version of Oppenheimer, which makes me feel like we're, we're in for a fair bit more of this kind of quote-unquote innovation um, that is hurling forward without thinking uh, really thinking a great deal about it. I mean, Elon Musk has just announced that Twitter is going to become a company called X, which will be an everything company that is driven by AI and, you know, b- do banking and, you know, God knows what else. So hold on to your butts, guys. This is uh, this is coming for us. But what's interesting with Musk is that he is also a bit of an AI doomer, right? In the sense that he has been sort of supportive of some of the people calling for a pause in AI research, and a certain amount of Musk's fascination with space travel rests on his f- professed fears about human extinction, the idea that we're going to, you know, that we're going to blow ourselves up in some way, shape, or form. Yeah. You know, Musk is sort of skeptical. But in some ways, that's the most dangerous, right? Because I think so was Oppenheimer, right? Like, there's this quality of being both aware of and smart enough to know how destructive this thing could be, but also so smart and so curious and driven that you can't help yes. but um, but want to push it as far as it can go. And it's actually exactly in the hands of someone like Elon Musk, who, who professes to understand the dangers, but nonetheless hears the siren song of of the future calling and of innovation and of science and of technology and sort of can't resist uh, following where it leads. Let, let me just play, I guess, devil's advocate for a minute on the, on the specific nuclear question, which I think is, it's true, as Michelle said, that we've only had nuclear weapons for 80 years, 80-odd uh, years, slightly less. And it is very hard for me to imagine a future in which they're never used. There's sort of a Chekhov's gun quality to (laughs) nukes in the world. Um, At the same time, we do have, you know, multiple generations now of evidence that human beings, when given this awesome power, power to destroy whole countries, if not the whole world, do flinch from it. Right. The the idea that you if you know if you hand human beings a awesome, terrifying technology, they will just use it, uh, has not been vindicated. So far, politics has actually worked to contain the use of nuclear weapons. The fear of AI is that it's the fear of something that makes decisions that aren't human anymore, that lead to destruction not through the sort of normal human power games and rivalries and so on that we're all familiar with, but through some sort of alien computational logic where it makes sense to fire all the nukes at once. And that, that to me, feels like a difference between some of the fears we have now and the fears people had at the start of the nuclear age. Now it's more like, well, we know what human nature is like, and we haven't used the weapons, but we don't know what AI is like, (laughs) and maybe AI will use them. What do you guys think of that? You know, I mean, there's questions about loose nukes, dirty nukes. Um, obviously, the war in Ukraine, you know, Putin is, is I think, not a, a stable figure. But I do think the point that we have greater faith in human, um, the known frailty of human decision making over the unknown power of um, of AI decision making and of rationality is a really important one. And I think that in some ways, like, connects us back to the film and that, you know, science actually should be under the control of politics because 
in a moment where we're all talking about we need to follow the science, follow the science, um, you know, science is a method. It's not um, an answer. It is a way of thinking about the world. And it needs to be balanced by other ways of thinking about the world. And those other ways include politics. They include religion. They include all kinds of uh, ways that human beings organize their affairs and think about their values and things like that. So so to me, it's absolutely critical that, um, that AI stay as far away from the these kinds of decisions as possible. Yeah, and I don't think we have to limit this just to, say, AI and nuclear weapons. I mean, we did just come through a pandemic where there were serious questions about whether this came out of a scientific experimental lab that then takes its toll on the entire planet. I mean, and it's just like people operate as though the unthinkable won't happen until, of course, the unthinkable does happen. And even if what the COVID-19 pandemic wound up coming from wasn't, in that case, a lab, which we may just never know, that doesn't mean that the next one won't. And we, we have all of these things going on scientifically that we just don't have a good grasp on or as good a grasp as we should have. I think one thing that that would be certainly more useful um, is if there is just an ongoing vibrant conversation among all those arenas that Lydia mentioned, science, politics, ethics, religion. And to the extent that a movie like Oppenheimer and a book like American Prometheus cannot, um, you know, lionize scientists and say like, you know, they've got the answers of only we've listened, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but rather enable this more of a give and take among these fields, I think we'd be better off. On that eloquent note, uh, we'll leave it there. And when we come back, we'll be talking about the geopolitical metaphors hidden inside the Barbie movie. No, I'm (laughs) I'm kidding. When we come back, we're going to get hot and cold. And we're back. And now it's time for Hot Cold, where one of us shares something that we're into or over or somewhere on the thermometer in between. And Michelle, I think you have something for us. All right. It is perfection that Ross has mentioned Barbie, because what I am hot on this week is the Barbenheimer phenomenon. Now, I'm not talking about the movies. I saw both of them. I enjoyed both of them. But what I enjoyed even more was the way that this phenomenon, which is, for those who haven't been paying attention, you know, kind of the portmanteau sprung up on social media because these two wildly different blockbusters were opening the same weekend. A challenge sprung up for people to go see both movies. I love this because we are at a period where going to the theater has become a rare event and seeing movies as a shared experience is happening less and less and less. So for something like this to pop up just felt kind of delightfully communal. You know, movie theaters were hosting costume parties and encouraging people to come in their pork pie hats or their pink outfits. And you just had these groups of people, especially with the Barbie crew, including my friends and I, taking pictures of each other, complimenting each other's outfits in the theater. It just had this feel, which was so unusual at this point in time. And it's something that I think we need, especially after the last few years of isolation and grimness and, you know, pandemic horror, just for people to have a moment where they can come together, no matter how silly it is, and share this sort of thing. And celebrate the invention of the atomic bomb. Yes, that's all. Hey, that's all com- I don't care. You can, you can argue that Mattel and Barbie have been its own kind of destructive <laughs> well, force as well. That's for a future, a f- a future episode. I was, I, I was going to say that Mark Harris, the film writer, said something, I think, on Twitter about how often unexpected hits are more sort of shocking and disruptive in Hollywood than unexpected busts. And... I think the hope right now for people who like the movies would be that Barbenheimer combined with the disappointments surrounding many, many superhero sequels and, you know, Indiana Jones reboots and so on will have some kind of 
substantial effect in what kind of movies get greenlit and made over the next couple of years, assuming, of course, that the writer's <laughs> strike ever ends and that Hollywood ever gets oh. back to making movies in the first place. This reminds me of a few years ago when Steve Martin was hosting the Academy Awards and he started off saying like, look, I don't know if you all know this, but I'm, I'm really especially happy to host this year's Academy Awards because all the proceeds from tonight's event are going to massive corporations. <laughs> so not to be, you know, a, a barb and whiner, but I was, I'm, you know, I don't take such joy in kind of being, you know, manipulated effectively by this kind of massive marketing campaign you, surrounding uh, these two movies. If you're movies. waiting for purity um, in your communal experience, you're going to die lonely. It's, this is America. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. I think there are, there are other ways to be communal, um, beyond, um, you know, paying $35 for popcorn and a soda. I'm just saying we've got to find a way to bring people back to communal events rather than sitting in their basements watching Netflix all the time. Then I'm all for that. I agree. And I think, um, you know, I've really been bitten by the movie bug lately. I just recently signed up for a uh, membership at Film Forum. I I saw Jean-Luc Godard's Contempt, a new print. There was a new print of Midnight Cowboy. So I'm all in on the return to the movies. And I don't think any of those movies are putting money in the pockets of giant corporations that exist as we know them today. So I can feel really good about, about all of that. <laughs> Until but, the Godard cinematic universe is launched. <laughs> it launches. But, but I <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I will say one of the one of the kind of light motifs of, of of my summer has been just an absolute joy at the return to you know kind of communal experiences. Um, you know, we've seen real trouble in the world of of theater, for example. I'm not talking about movie theaters. I'm talking about acting and actors on stage and things like that. And, um, you know, all of us need to vote with our feet and go and, and watch the theater, go to the movies, do things like this. Thank if We want you, these Lydia. things to be part of our culture going forward. So I am with you, Michelle. I've got my bucket of popcorn, my there giant go. gallon jug of Diet Coke and Twizzlers, and I'm, I'm ready to go. Uh, so I guess I'll see you at the movies. Fantastic. I'll be wearing my hot pink disco jumpsuit. And on that note, as I clutch my Robert Oppenheimer action figure, that's our show for the week. Bye, guys. See you next week. Thanks for listening. Please follow Matter of Opinion in your favorite podcast app. And if you like the show, leave us a review. Or if you want to share your thoughts with us directly, our email is matteropinion at nytimes.com. Matter of Opinion was produced by Phoebe Lett, Sophia Alvarez-Boyd, and Derek Arthur. It is edited by Stephanie Joyce. Our fact check team is Kate Sinclair, Mary Marge Locker, and Michelle Harris. Original music by Isaac Jones, Ephim Shapiro, Carol Sabaro, Sonia Herrero, and Pat McCusker. Mixing by Pat McCusker. Audience strategy by Shannon Busta and Christina Samuluski. Our executive producer is Annie Rose Strasser. <laughs>